Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatory. So let's have a little look at my bastard, the bastard from Dynasty Forge. Uh, link below to the listing of it where you can find all the specs and stuff. So I've done a previous uh, review of this, which again I'll link below. But now you're going to see me doing some cutting with it. Before we go into that, and I'll talk more about the results and my thoughts about the sword afterwards, um, but before we go into that, I just want to remind everyone that I'm just cutting water bottles. Water bottles aren't an analogue for a particular type of target or part of the arm. They're not even necessarily difficult to cut, and also what cuts a water bottle well isn't necessarily what will cut a body or a clothed body or whatever else well. Um, so as various people have pointed out, yes indeed you can cut water bottles with a kitchen knife. Funnily enough, in many ways it's easier to cut water bottles with a kitchen knife than it is with a falchion for example. So generally speaking, um, tip heavy, slower moving um, swords are more difficult to get through uh, water bottles. So. Water bottles are a very odd target, but we use them just because they're freely available, easy to grab hold of, and a lot easier um, to procure for these sorts of videos than things like a pig carcass or lots of tatami mats or something. And I'd also point out as well that things like tatami mats are a particular target, and they aren't necessarily anything like cutting through a clothed body either. Um, and cutting through a clothed body versus an unclothed body is very different and blah blah blah. That's a whole big topic which I've spoken about in the past and I'm sure I'll talk about again. Anyway, let's without further ado go on to have a look at um, some cutting with the very pretty Type 16 um, longsword or bastard sword from Dynasty Forge.
So I hope that was somewhat uh, entertaining. Uh, there were a few things that I should mention um, off the bat about this sword. So number one, I was very impressed by two particular things when this sword arrived. Number one, the stiffness of the blade. Now, a stiff blade, not all types of blade are stiff, it has to be said, but stiff blades tend to be forgiving blades. It's one of the reasons that katanas make a very good kind of beginner cutting swords, as it were, because they're very forgiving. A stiff blade, like a katana, um, if you get the edge alignment slightly wrong, a stiff blade tends to stay straight and drag its way through the target anyway, or at least cut it to some extent, even if it doesn't go all the way through. A flexible blade, if you get the edge alignment ever so slightly wrong, it exacerbates the problem and the blade flexes and it kind of exponentially goes worse and just slaps the target. So uh, if any of you watch for, um, Forged in Fire, incidentally, you will often notice this, the more flexible swords are often the ones that they muck up the cuts with. It's simply because a stiffer blade is easier, it's more forgiving to get through the target. I should also mention stiffness relates to length as well. So if you have a very long sword, like a Spyhander or Claymore type thing, um, then you're more likely to end up with a flexible blade because of its length and because of keeping it manageable in terms of weight. A short blade, like a cookery or a bowie knife, is obviously going to be incredibly stiff because it's short. Um, so this sword, impressively, is both relatively long and pretty damn stiff. And one of the reasons for that is it is really nice and thick. It's about probably about eight millimeters thick at the base of the blade and has really good distal taper. So as well as having what I'd call um, profile taper or kind of silhouette taper, in other words, it's pointy, um, it does also have distal taper. The result is that, and I'll be careful because this is a sharp blade, it is, you can flex it, as you can see, but it is a pretty stiff blade. Not as stiff as a katana, but stiffer than a lot of long swords out there. Now, um, I have owned a similar model of sword to this in the past, um, which was the Albion Cressy. Now, the Cressy is a little bit different. It's got slightly more bowed out edges, a little bit broader at the center of percussion. This is a bit narrower. But as a simple conclusion, for me, this cut slightly better than the Cressy, with one caveat. The Cressy came to me not particularly sharp. Um, this is sharper out of the box than the Albion Cressy that I had previously. And I sharpened up that Cressy so that it was sharper than this is. Now, not to say that this is blunt, but I am running my, fairly gingerly and fairly softly, I am running my fingers up and down the edge on both sides here. This is exactly the same edge as you've just seen me cutting through water bottles with. So I can happily, without cutting myself, run my fingers up and down this edge. I'm not applying pressure because if I apply pressure, um, then it will start to cut. Uh, but there isn't much bite to that blade. Now, that's not to say that it's blunt. It's not. It's actually got very good edge geometry and it comes down to a very fine edge, but it's not quite kind of biting sharp. It's not quite, some people would say, razor sharp. I don't really like that term. I prefer something like almost like a microscopic saw edge on my swords. Um, but it's not quite there. It doesn't have that bite. When you run your fingers over it, you can't feel it snagging on the skin. You can't find it, uh, you can't feel it wanting to sort of um, soar into your skin basically. It's a horrible feeling but uh, but you can't feel that. It is a fine edge which, almost like a chisel edge actually, which will cut through water bottles. And once again, I'll just remind you all, water bottles are a very particular target. They're hard plastic on the outside and nothing on the inside water. The water's just there to provide weight. No real resistance, um, or resistance to cutting through anyway. So water, uh, bo water bottles are a very particular type of target. And some types of sword, for example, rapiers will cut through water bottles very successfully. But if you take, a, for example, a dead pig carcass and try and cut into a pig carcass with a, with a very narrow uh, blade, usually you don't do too well, but something like a falchion will do very well. Well, um, so this blade really, that we, so therefore we're using the water bottles just simply as, a, as an analog to get some information from. It's not supposed to represent anything. And what I can tell you from doing that with this sword is number one, um, it's got good edge geometry. Number two, it's stiff. Those are very good things, okay? Don't underestimate how few um, long swords out there, including some quite expensive ones, don't have either of those features. So it's got good edge geometry and it's stiff. It does need better sharpening out of the box, but I have to say, I have barely ever had a sword that has come straight from a seller to me that has been super duper sharp 
um, straight out of the box, I'm afraid. So I don't view that as a massive minus factor. It's just something that I mentioned to you to be aware of. It does require some edge polishing or edge honing to bring it up to really super duper cutting sharp. In terms of the uh, hilt construction, um, so I, as mentioned previously, I had some concerns about the fact this is a nut here, it's a round nut, so it looks like a, it looks like a pommel peen, but it is actually a nut. Uh, that was a tiny bit loose when it came to me and I tightened it up uh, without damaging it at all. Um, there are various ways of doing that, which I won't go into now, but I tightened that up and it all is absolutely tight and there's no rattles, anything else. Um, it's it's a, funny enough, now I say that, I say no rattles, that actually doesn't really ring. So that could do with a bit of tightening up. Obviously, I've just been cutting with it, but I didn't feel any rattles, should we say, when I was cutting, but that's... That's not great. That could do with tightening up, definitely. So I, that is a minor criticism. I'm still not 100% convinced by their, by Dynasty Forge's um, choice of the type of nut up here and how easy it is to tighten up and how strong it might be and all of that kind of stuff. But generally speaking, I didn't experience any major negative um, uh, sort of feedback from that cutting session I've just done. In terms of the pommel and the cross, nothing really you know, nothing constructive to say. They are what they are. They do the job. They look okay. Um, they're very high mirror polish, which is disconcerting to some people. But uh, anyway, they were comfortable to use. Now the grip. The grip is a nice shape and it seems to be well made. I do have one criticism of the grip and that is that this leather, which has got a quite a modern look to it, it's like a modern chromed leather, is quite slippy. Um, now if we look at some higher end um, medieval sword replicas will find that these grips usually are veg tanned leather with a waxy finish on them which has an almost sticky feel and in addition to that the cord underneath so this is quite fat cord as you can see so the ridges are quite big and rounded the cord generally speaking wants to be a bit smaller than that so I would suggest to Dynasty Forge in the future to maybe look at veg tanned leather or something with a little bit more friction to it and possibly changing from such big cord to smaller cord um, but something with a bit more friction to this grip would be nice not that I suffered any problems with it being slippy or anything like that but I could feel that the potential was there for some people to find that grip slippy, perhaps if it was wet, all these kind of things. The blade, I'm a big fan of. I love the edge, edge geometry. Um, I love the just the fit, finish of it. The fuller is perfectly straight. There's no ripples in the blade. Uh, looking up it, it's got a lovely, lovely flat finish. Um, I keep mentioning edge geometry, but that is a major factor of this sword. But also distal taper. The distal taper is very, very good on this. Um, so. My major criticism points for this are I'm still not 100% convinced by that nut construction. Personally, I think it would be better if it was peened, um, or if, there, if it has to have a nut up there, if the nut is somehow more substantial or a little bit more, fills me with a little bit more confidence than that little nut does. It does, it is recessed into the pommel, but it's just, it just doesn't feel like it's that strong. Um, that's number one. Number two is the finish on the grip. And number three is the sharpness out of the box. Although I have to say, when you're factory producing something, you can't make every sword absolutely you know razor sharp like the uh, end user is going to make it themselves probably um, but it would be nice if it was a little bit sharper than this it, i could feel on some of those cuts i was powering through the bottles rather than slicing through the bottles it wasn't necessarily easy to cut although it was generally speaking a good cutter as a result of the stiffness and the edge geometry in terms of how the sword moves and handles i love it i prefer this to my albion cressy i had before um, I'm a Fiore practitioner, I teach Fiore delivery, and this is pretty much for me the perfect size and shape for a Fiore uh, longsword. And you will have noticed in the videos there that I did do some one-handed stuff as well to show that this is a true bastard. It is a one and a half handed sword, hand and a half sword. You can obviously usually use it in two hands, but you can use it in one hand if you're on horseback or using a shield or whatever. So you can at a push use it as a one-handed sword as well. Anyway, I hope that's been a useful review and I'll see you again soon for another video on Scholar Gladiatoria channel. See you folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.